And uh, without too much further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Riley Noyes. Riley's a former advisor. Um, he's been in the industry a long time, but he's now written two best-selling books, uh, The Money Coach, and more recently, The Four Phases of Retirement. And uh, we provide a copy of the book, or we will provide a copy of this book to you to take with you today. Uh, Dr. Moynes is a very engaging speaker and uh, will now take you through his workshop. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Riley Moynes. Well, thank you, Dean and, uh, and Susie. It's nice to be here. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here today. And uh, look forward to sharing with you some ideas that I hope will be of uh, a real interest and of value to you as you as you head into retirement or as you deal with retirement, depending on your circumstances. So let me begin by that. Let me, if, if I may, ask just briefly, show of hands, those who are currently in the preparation for retirement mode. Okay, 40, 50%, and the remainder, I'm sure, are, are in the retirement mode. For those of you who are preparing, my hope is that our, our work today, our presentation today, and, and the copy of the book that you'll be receiving will give you a heads up as to the sorts of things that you can anticipate will hit you in the face when you retire. For those of you who are already in retirement, I'm hoping that our presentation and, and the book will give you a sense of, of uh, a framework that can help you perhaps understand a little bit better than you might right now what it is you're going through or will be going through, some of the challenges and changes that inevitably accompany retirement. So that's what we're aiming for uh, today. And uh, let's get started. Lee Iacocca is quoted as saying, everyone says you've got to get ready financially, but no, no, you've got to get ready psychologically. Now, of course, you do need to get ready financially, and that's what, that's what the Asante team here, Dean and Susie and their gang, help you to do. And of course, there's more to it than that with some of the estate planning and all of that kind of stuff. And there's been lots and lots written about that. But what hasn't been explored very much in my experience are those psychological changes and challenges that virtually everyone faces when they get to retirement. There is very little in the research as yet. And so in a sense, I'm hoping that you'll kind of see that perhaps we're, we're breaking some new ground here today and discussing something that really is, is uh, a little difficult to get one's hands on. I certainly wish I knew then what I know now about what was going to be facing me in retirement. So let's start with some background and some facts and figures. Much of the presentation is facts and figures. I've drawn from Statistics Canada, I've drawn from research studies that I could find uh, that were pertinent, although as I say, it really not an awful lot has been done as yet. Um, but interestingly, as I was doing some of the work to be prepared for this presentation and for the book, I did come across one really interesting research study that really had very little to do with the topic that we're discussing today, but it had a lot to do with what's happening in this room today. Here's what this research said. It said that for any group of people 25 or larger in size, this is what's going to happen in this room in the next 30 minutes. One third of you will pay really close attention and you'll take some notes. A lot of teachers will be in that room. <laughs> there will be another group of about a third who will pay a lesser degree of attention and you will not take any notes because you see there's all kinds of stuff on the table for you right now. Anyway, you don't need to take notes. Then there's the third group, the final third, which according to the research will at some point during the next 30 minutes allow your minds to drift into some sort of sexual fantasy. <laughs> That's what the research proves conclusively. <laughs> so, I want you to know that I've been in front of audiences long enough to know when that's happening. <laughs> okay, so if you see this every now and then, that's just a little subtle warning that I know that you're drifting away from this. 
Anyway, some of the more important statistics. Baby boomers, those of us born between 1946 and 1965, hit retirement age in 2011. Boomers now represent 27% of the Canadian population, but only 18 to 20% of boomers have reached age 65. Only 18 to 20% have reached age 65. The peak doesn't come for at least another 10 years. And that means, that means that we are facing a retirement landslide, a tsunami of retirement. 10,000 North Americans retire every single day and will for the next 15 to 20 years. 10,000 people today yesterday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and on almost ad infinitum. Boomers over 65 now represent about 16% of the population, double the proportion that we represented in 1971, but less than half of what we will represent in the next 10 to 15 years. 10,000 retirees every day. It's monumental. At the same time, life expectancy, as you're fully aware, has grown. Back in 1950, life expectancy in North America was 68 years. Therefore, we could expect three robust years of retirement. I think that's where the image of retirement started, where people kind of retired to the rocking chair with the old corn pipe and waited for the end. And that image of retirement still exists in some people's minds. But look what's happened over the last several years. 2017, the most recent year for which statistics are available. Now in North America, 82. 17 years of life, of, of, of expected retirement. But the point is, we're living longer than ever before. And I'm going to say to you with absolute confidence that there is a large group a large number of folks here today who will spend one-third of your life in retirement. One-third of your life in retirement. What a sea change from 1950 where you could expect three years. A third of your life in retirement. A couple of years ago, and this is not the clearest image I know because it's been it's taken from a, from a video. But two or three years ago, Prudential Life Insurance uh, set up in a park in Austin, Texas. And they set up this great big board that you can, that you can see. Uh, the board is uh, 10 or 12 feet high, and it's 30 or 40 feet long. And you can appreciate that when something that big gets set up in an open space, it starts to attract attention. And as you can see, they placed on the board uh, age 65, and they've gone all the way through. And what they did was to distribute to people who began to gather around little, um, little round things, kind of like Frisbees. They're, they're, they're magnetic. And they asked people to approach the wall and to place on the wall the little disc that they had been given to represent the age of the oldest person they know. And so you can see that there's a, a kind of a ladder here and the pe people up here are actually moving, so it's kind of hard to see them clearly, but, but there's retirement age, there's life expectancy in North America, about 82. Look where all the dots are. My mom would be here. She turned 98 this year. And look at all the over hundreds, which is why we can say with increasing, increasing confidence, that there is a very good likelihood that many of us are going to spend up to one third of our lives in retirement. So the question is, how are we going to spend that time productively and meaningfully? That's the challenge. That's the challenge that we all face. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Let me begin by telling you a little bit of a story about how I got interested in this, in this topic. We're lucky enough to spend some time in Florida in the winter. We belong in a, a golf community in southwest Florida. 
And uh, each morning, not every morning, but Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 o'clock, there is a group of us that gather at the clubhouse, and we uh, are planning a walk, about a one-hour walk. And our primary purpose is to put our 10,000 steps on our pedometers, right, on our Fitbits. And then we end up always, of course, at Panera's and at coffee and donuts and all the things that take away from the walk. Anyway, we got in the habit uh, during these walks of uh, having a, a specific discussion so that we would ask someone each day to set the, the topic for the following day. And as you can appreciate, all kinds of topics, uh, sports, of course, and, and, and movies and books and Politics, not so much recently, I've discovered on our walks. It used to be a big topic, but no one wants to go there anymore. So anyway, all kinds of these different topics. Well, one day, the person responsible for setting the topic asked this question. What are the elements of a successful retirement? What are the elements of a successful retirement? Hmm. How's that for 7 o'clock in the morning? So we kicked that one around for an hour and we went to Panera's and the next day we had another topic. But it was a topic that stayed with me because at that time I was experiencing some, some difficulties, some challenges with this whole thing. What does make a successful retirement? You see, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what success looked like in business or in the professions. But when it came to retirement, it was much, much fuzzier for me. I really wasn't sure about that. So what I did was to look at the research, and I, as I mentioned, I, I found relatively little uh, on the topic that I was interested in. Most of it was the financial side of it and the estate side of it. All important, of course, for sure. But I just couldn't find things that I was looking for, and so I decided that what I had to do, what I wanted to do, was to interview a whole bunch of retired people. And I asked them that question. What are the elements of a successful retirement? And the result of that is really what I'm presenting to you today and what you will receive in the copy of the Four Phases of Retirement at the, end of our, at the end of our session. The good news is I discovered there is a framework and there is a pattern that can help. There is. There's a guiding blueprint. There's kind of a master plan. There's a there is a chart, there's a map, if you know what you're looking for. So with that, let me draw your attention to the first sheet on your little package here. It's called the 99 There are pens, I think, on the tables as well. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. On this, on this sheet are numbers from 1 to 99. When I say go, I'm going to ask you to find number 1, circle it, then look for number 2, circle it, number 3, circle it, and see how far you can go up the, the ladder in the next 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Some suggestions. 
Let me ask you to draw a line, uh, a vertical line down the middle of the page, down the approximate middle of the page, and horizontal line across of the approximate middle of the page, dividing the page into four quadrants. Let me add one more piece of information. Number one is in the top right quadrant. Number two is in the top left quadrant. Number three is in the bottom left quadrant. Number four is in the bottom right quadrant, and so on. Now with this new information, now that you know what you're looking for, let's take another 30 seconds, pick up where you left off, and see how much closer we can get to 99. Ready, go. You might have been otherwise. So when we're finished our brief time together in 30 or 30 minutes or so from now, if the master plan unfolds, this is what's going to have happened. You're going to know what the four phases of retirement are. If you are retired, you will know what phase you're in right now. And you will also take away with you four tools that can help you to get to phase four if you decide that's what, where you'd like to be. And I urge you, that's where you'd like to be, phase four, for reasons that will become clear very shortly, I think. Okay? So that's what we're aiming for. So let's get started. Phase one. I talk about phase one as the vacation phase. This is a time that generally lasts one to three years. Rarely beyond that in my experience. It's a time when it's really all about you. You know, you have worked hard for it for whatever number of years it is, and now, darn it, you're going to tick off some of the things that you had been putting on that bucket list over the years that you never had time to do before, or perhaps didn't have the resources to do, or just didn't get around to for whatever reason. And you're determined that now is your time. And that's great. That's the way it should be. You're going to fulfill lifelong dreams, whatever they might be. Lots of people pick up on the travel, or they spend more time on the golf game, or maybe even take some lessons, or a sports car, or a yacht, or a boat, or whatever it might be, or perhaps a place in a, in a warmer climate. All of those things are typical of the things we see people doing in phase one of retirement. Very much like vacation, right? When you are away for a week or two, you have no set routine. You can get up when you want. You go to bed when you want. You eat what you want. You do exactly what you want. It's wonderful. That's what makes it a vacation. And what you really appreciate is this not having a routine. Because your life has been built around routines that, generally speaking, other people have imposed on you. And now, you're a boss. But there's a problem. And the problem, in my experience and in my interviews, is that after a period of time, between one and three years, often not quite that long, actually, we begin to get bored. 
with no routine. Because there's something in our DNA, I think, that makes us need a routine. It's better if it's our routine, our imposed routine, than somebody else's, but there's something in us that needs a kind of routine. And so after this period of time, whatever it might be, we start to feel a little bit antsy. And we can't figure out why, because my God, we've worked all these years and now we're doing exactly the things we wanted to do. Why? What's the matter? Well, the matter is routine in many cases. You see, retirement has been described somewhat dramatically as a plunge into the abyss of insignificance. <laughs> And there are people who will say that's exactly what it is. My experience is that particularly people who have been forced to retire feel this way. Somebody else's decision, out you go. But there is no doubt that this so-called drop from the top has been documented as one of life's top 10 traumas. You see, we spend 20 years or so of our lives being conditioned to be productive members of society. Taught to be on time, taught to show up, taught to say please and thank you. All the sorts of things that our parents believe are going to help us to be productive members of society. Then we move into a work career, in many cases, a profession, a calling, a mission, whatever it might be. And we may spend 40 plus years there. And we use some of the skills that we were taught as we were in training, and we become successful. We learn some of the rules, and, and we learn the ropes, and, 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 we, and we become conditioned to a, to a, a job-based routine. And some of us are lucky enough to, to make what we think is some progress, and we climb the ladder, and we become responsible perhaps for some people, or some money, or whatever the case might be. But all of a sudden, whether it's someone else's decision or ours, at some point in our lives, it's over. It's over. And we now face up to 30 years of our life entering a part of our lives that we know very little about. There are no rules that I've ever been told about or have ever been able to discover for retirement. And it's kind of figure it out yourself. Very difficult, people find. When we're at the point where we are feeling a little bit dissatisfied with our phase one, our vacation, we are now entering phase two. It's the phase when, as I described it, we feel lost and we feel lost. Very few people avoid all of these. Very few people in my experience. Most of us suffer one or more, in most cases, all of these. Some, of course, in various degrees of severity and for various periods of time. But it's unusual, in my experience, for people to avoid these. So here's what happens. What do we lose? We lose structure. That's what we were just referring to, our routine. We thought we didn't like it, until we didn't have it. And now we miss it. We miss that structure. We miss the rhythm that is often associated with different professions, teaching or with accounting, or different rhythms in different jobs that you can kind of anticipate. That's the way it goes. All of a sudden, it's gone. We lose our identity. Males, in particular, tend to associate their self-worth with their jobs, with their professions, with their callings. Although it's strong in many cases uh, in women as well. Many people, even when they're retirement, as they introduce themselves, or they, they are introduced, oh, he's a teacher, oh, he's a accountant, oh, lawyer, she, this. Even though we're not anymore, but that's our identity. And when it's gone, it matters to us in ways that we often won't even admit to ourselves. We lose relationships. Some of the most significant relationships that we develop are often work-based. They start with work colleagues, but they often develop into lifelong friendships. And yes, you can go, and I've done it, and so you've probably done it as well, you can go and have coffee with the boys or with the gals once a month and get caught up, but you know darn quickly 
that you're the odd person out. They've moved on. They're still at it. You can go like, two or three times and you've had it. Those relationships largely are gone. A sense of purpose is often associated with our profession or our calling as well. It's what gets us up in the morning. It's what we love to do in many cases. And then depending, there may be a sense of power that we feel we've lost. Again, if we may be responsible for some personnel or for some budgets, all of a sudden it's gone. Five significant losses, and to make it worse, they all occur simultaneously. Bam, 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 bam! Five headshots from a heavyweight boxer. It would be easier, perhaps, if one happened one year and then the next one happened the next year. But five simultaneously kills us. In phase two, we are at greater risk for depression. The Mayo Clinic has stated that there is a 40% likelihood that people who retire will experience symptoms of clinical depression. 40% likelihood across the gamut. Often physical decline. In phase two, we're just kind of, we're just not ourselves. And even if we may have done a regular kind of exercise routine, it's easier to just sit in the chair and not bother. And of course, it exacerbates things. Divorce. North America, divorces among people over 50 have doubled. And for those over 65, tripled since 1990. Highest rate of suicide in Canada now, men over 75. <clears throat> men over 75. This is not pretty in phase two. It is not pretty at all. But most of us are going to go through it, parts of it, experience it in various depths and for various periods of time. So get ready for it. Get ready for it. It's natural. It's not the end of the world. It's a phase. But it's a phase that can make us feel like that. We've been hit by a bus. It's not a good time in many people's in many people's lives, to be sure. It's true, there seems to be no doubt about it. All of my interviews, all of the research that I've been able to, to come across and to discover says the same thing. Before we can achieve some of the results that are most definitely possible in phases three and four. We are going to experience these feelings of fear and anxiety and uncertainty. It's just the way it is in most situations for most people. It's just the way it is. Because it's really only, it seems, when we suffer the five losses that we really begin to ponder what's important in our lives. It's kind of like the addict, like the alcoholic, who has to hit bottom before there's a recognition that there's a problem and that they don't want to carry on this way. It seems like that's kind of part of the way, the way we're made up. Very difficult to avoid. Now to make things even worse in phase two, which is not my purpose except to tell you the truth, there was another interesting study that I came across from the University of Greenwich. And it said that in addition to the sorts of these five major losses that we often feel that are associated with retirement, mid-60s to mid-70s also represent another real challenge for many people because in addition to the woes that come with phase two, they talk about some of the other things that seem to crop up during this time of our lives. Bereavement of loved ones, loss of loved ones. Illness, personal illness, or illness of those close to us. Um, and, and, and the need in many cases to care for 
disabled friends or, or family. So it's not kind of just the retirement aspect of it that makes it so difficult, but some of the natural evolution that seems to happen in human society at about that time. So phase two, very difficult, uh, not one that we want to spend any longer in than possible. The good news is that at some point, most of us say to ourselves, or perhaps to a spouse or to a friend, I don't want to live like this for the rest of my life, and I'm going to do something about it, something positive about it. And at that point, the rehab begins. At that point, when we decide that I'm not going to go on like this forever, that's the beginning of good news. And that good news is represented by phase three. Phase three is the time, I refer to it as the time of trial and error. And given the fact that we have decided that we're not going to live the rest of our lives in this blue funk that we associate with phase two, we're going to do something about it, but we have to begin to ask ourselves, how can I still contribute? What is it that I still have that keeps me interested, or that, that makes me interested? That's something that I can perhaps make a contribute, make some sort of contribution to. We have to ask ourselves these questions, or else there's no moving out of phase two. We have to understand that it will often involve false starts, and I'll share a couple of the false starts that I experienced in just a couple of moments. Most people tend to choose initiatives that are based on their interests, their past interests, or their experience, their experiences, or just plain old inquisitiveness. I've had some terrific interviews with people who said, I just decided that I was going to learn how to play the trombone. I've never played a musical instrument in my life before, but I'm going to be a trombone player. Or I just decided that I'm going to go and help little kids do better at math, and they go and volunteer and do that sort of thing. Or I'm going to do this with my grandchildren, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going to start a business, or I'm going to start a, a, a non-profit. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write my memoirs. It doesn't matter. It's important, though, that there's the action taken. And it's also important that we realize that we need to go back to the drawing board if and when an initiative fails. And the odds are that not, it will not be your first bright idea that brings you forward. As an example, uh, when I was in phase three, I didn't know it was phase three at the time. I, 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 I wish I knew then what I know now, but I realized now it was phase three. And I began to wonder, what am I going to do? What can I do? What, what, what will help me get out of this? Anybody familiar with uh, the uh, organization called First, the First T? First T, no. It's a, it's a youth development program based on golf in the US. It's sponsored by the PGA of America, by the LPGA. Uh, Tiger Woods and um, Jeff Nicholas and uh, Arnold Palmer and uh, a number of others have contributed a million dollars each individually to the first team. They believe in it. And it's a terrific youth development program that teaches values uh, to kids who might otherwise not have the opportunity to play golf at all. Uh, I had this bright idea. There is a first tee in Montreal. There's a first tee in Vancouver. No first tee in Toronto, where, where I'm based. Oh, I'm going to start a first tee in Toronto. It'll be a great opportunity. It'll be great. I've got people lined up and so on and so on. Talk to the folks at first tee in Florida. They're in Jacksonville, Florida. Great idea. But Riley, you should just be aware of the fact that since the one in Vancouver started and the one in Montreal started, there's been a new organization created in Canada called Golf Canada. You need to deal with them. Went to Golf Canada, this bright idea, uh, and basically I was shocked to learn that politics sometimes get involved in these decisions. It's a shocking discovery for me. Anyway, they have their own little program that they say is as good as the first team. They're delusional in my view, but that's okay. They believe it. And furthermore, we are not going to allow another first team in Canada. 
So I go back to the first tee. The first tee says, Riley, we'd love to be in Toronto, but we're not going to fight with Golf Canada. We've got enough going on here in the States. We're, we're blowing the doors off. We don't need to get into a fight there. So that was about two years of effort involved that messed, that, that didn't, didn't go anywhere. So, secondly, my son, who lives out in uh, Nelson, British Columbia, beautiful Nelson, British Columbia, in the Kootenays, produces what I consider to be, as an objective grandfather speaking, of course, uh, or father, produces two of the finest, highest quality outdoor magazines that exist in this country. In fact, this year they were nominated as Magazine of the Year, and they were up against Cosmopolitan and Time Magazine. Uh, needs to say they did not win, but they were in that category. So my son Peter said, well, Dad, maybe a uh, better idea, maybe we'd like to expand into Ontario. We think there might be an opportunity for a high-quality outdoor magazine uh, in Ontario, around this area, actually. And so we thought, well, let's, let's have a look at that. So 18 months invested in that, and Peter decided, at the end of it all, uh, he was going to stick with uh, two of these magazines that are out in British Columbia, focus there, not have to worry about long distance, so that one kind of fell apart. And I won't bore you with any more, there were about four others that were part of my phase three experience. The point simply is that it's unusual in people that I've talked to, and certainly in my own experience, that the first idea works. But you've got to go back to the drawing board, because if you don't go back to the drawing board, there's a chance of, of drifting back into phase two, which is not where we want to be. I believe that about 50 to 60 percent of retirees get to phase four. That's kind of my next research project is to be clearer about that, but I'm speaking kind of uh, based on the best information I have available at this time. So not everyone breaks through and reaches phase four, but I can tell you this without any question whatsoever. Those who do are some of the happiest people I have ever, ever met. If you get to phase four, it just, there's just a beam, there's a glow on their faces in phase four. So I believe it's to be, it's worthy of, of, um, of um, striving for. In phase four, there's hard work to be done because it doesn't just happen. We have to be introspective. And people don't really like to be introspective, generally speaking, in my experience. But today, for a few minutes, we're gonna be introspective, if you would. I hope it'll help. Breaking through into phase four requires answering some questions. If you are in retirement, it's important to know where you are now. So you need to know what phase you're in. And this is the harder part, I find, for many people because we just, for some reason, we don't want to talk about this very much. But it's important because we're all here for a reason and it's important to know what it is. So I need people to get to phase four who are prepared to ask themselves, what is it that I was put on this earth to do and what am I going to devote myself to for the remainder of my working uh, of my retirement. And I can tell you that it almost always, not always, but almost always, involves service to others. Not necessarily volunteer service. There's nothing wrong with making money doing something that provides a service to others as well. But it almost always involves providing service to others. Winston Churchill, I believe, had it right. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And that's the golden opportunity that exists in phase four. When we're re relieved of some financial constraints that we might have had before, we're also assuming, of course, reasonably good health because without both of those, I know that retirement can look very, very different. But with those two assumptions, there's a marvelous opportunity in phase four. 
let me just spend a moment on this one to help kind of set the background for, for uh, unique ability. There is a wide range of things at which I am completely and happily incompetent. <laughs> and I'll bet the same applies to you. A whole slew of things that you know nothing about, have no clue about. I think of that stuff that Jeff did that back there for me to get this going today. And I think, thank God for people like that. So there's a wide range, an ocean of things at which I am incompetent, and probably you too. As we move closer to the center here, there are a smaller number of things that I do, and I suspect that you do, competently. If required, I can barbecue a hamburger. <laughs> if my sons aren't around, and if no one else can take me off the hook, I can do it, competently. One of the few things. As we move closer together to the center, there is a smaller number of things that I do, and there's a smaller number of things I believe that you do very well. And in the middle, what I call unique ability, and it doesn't mean that no one else on earth has that ability. It just means it's something that you do really well. And your unique ability is a combination of things that you love to do and that you do superbly well. And everybody has at least one of those. And it's important to know what it is that we can apply as we move towards phase four. So let me draw your attention, if you would, to the second uh, little piece of the package that you have. Tool number one, my unique ability. Tool number one, my unique ability. Your unique ability is something that you love to do, that you do extremely well, and that has led to success in the past for you. So the question is, what is it? And we're going to take just a couple of moments to kind of prime the pump here. I'm going to ask you to not be shy. This is where you list some of your talents, some of the things you do really well, some of your personal strengths, special qualities, things that you do well and that you love to do and that have probably led to success at various times in your life. Let's just take a couple of moments to get things started, get the juices flowing. We have more paper if required. <laughs> Ideally, at some point, maybe now, maybe in the future, but ideally, you would be able to describe your unique ability in one or two sentences. That's very powerful. To know and to be able to state succinctly what your unique ability is. And you may have more than you may have more than one. Of them. 
but to be able to identify succinctly, this is one of my new proposals. Very powerful. Another 30 seconds or so on this one, and then we'll press on. I'm hoping that this, as I say, will be a primer of the pump, and that you may want to take these with you and uh, give some further thought over coffee or that sort of thing. It uh, can be very helpful when you're plotting the next 30 years of your life. I mentioned at the beginning then that you're going to take away with you four tools that you can use should you decide you'd like to get to phase four. This is a quick look at the, at the, at the uh, tool number one. Let's have a look at the next one in your little package. Tool two, the high point. When we're looking at that one, I'm asking you to consider here on the screen, what are some of the things that have given you the greatest satisfaction throughout your life? Whether it be domestically, whether it be professionally, what is it that you have found highly gratifying over the course of your life? Your ability to do something. I've got it set up here kind of chronologically with various stages of your life, and, and if that helps to, to, to trigger some thoughts, great, but don't, don't be constrained by that. I'm really asking you to consider some of the high points of your life. Decisions that you made, actions you took, skills that you had developed and applied that led to real success. Everybody in this room has at least 10 of those. Another 30 seconds or so on this one. You need more paper. Moving on. Uh, next in your package is uh, tool number three, common thread. Uh, sorry, no, it's not in your package. What I'm going to ask you to do instead, there is no tool number three, no tool number three. What I'm going to ask you to do is to place on the, pay, on the uh, table in front of you on the left, tool number one, your unique ability, and place right beside that tool number two, high points of my life. So you can see them both at the same time. One beside the other, yep, yeah, thank you. And I'm going to surmise this, that your experience is that some of your unique abilities have led to high points of your life. So I'm going to ask you to look for those connections Make those connections with your pen in some way. Draw the connection that you see 
between your unique ability, some of those things you do really, really well and love to do, and the results that led to some of the high points of your life. Just make that connection, if you would, physically, graphically, so you can see it. Okay, we're getting close, we're getting close, we're getting close. Well, you can see the connection between some of those unique abilities and some of the success that you've had. We're getting very close to deciding the big question, what it is that you're here to do in the next 30 years of your life. I believe that when we combine the things about which we are passionate, the things that we love to do, as represented here by the top circle, and at the point that that overlaps with some of the strengths and gifts that you've been given, i.e. unique ability, and when we combine that with something that almost everybody in almost every interview that I conducted in one way or another made reference to there's something in us that makes us want to make a difference in the world we want to leave the world a better place if only marginally then we found it over and over and over again that was a constant so my proposal is at the point where those three circles overlap that small space there that's your sweet spot. That's, that's whatever that is. That's why you're here. That's what you want to commit yourself to. That's what's going to get you up and get you interested and move you forward and make a contribution that you're going to be pleased about. That's what phase four people experience. So, tool number four, my life's purpose, my life's mission. What am I here for? I've listed 10 things that people have said in the past. Maybe there are some ideas, some thoughts, some concepts there that speak to you that you'd like to, that you'd like to hijack for your own. But ideally, again, you would be able to succinctly state your life's purpose in one sentence or more or two. Very few people in my experience are able to do that. But those who can have, a, have a, a sense of power that just emanates from them that is wonderful to see. So, 60 seconds. Get it started. Or maybe get it finished. What is it that's going to make you want to get up and do something? What is it you want to do? I prefer everything from, I want to be the best, the best grandparent that ever walked the face of this earth. I want to write my memoirs. I want to write a, 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 a lewd and lavicious novel and make a million dollars. I've always wanted to write it. I might as well turn it in. <laughs> try to turn it into something. Steve Jobs talked about putting a, a dent in the universe. Well, he pretty ambitious and he probably succeeded. Maybe our, our goals are not quite that elevated. But maybe he's just to put a little scratch or to write our initials in wet cement. We can do better than that.
may I just ask, and I'm not going to embarrass, I'm not going to go on beyond, I'm just interested, is there anyone in the room currently who knows exactly what their life's purpose is and can state it in one or two sentences? Man, you can? Yes. Good. I'm not going to ask you to do it, but no. good for you. Yes, sir? Oh, my Three? Good. Terrific. Terrific. But only three who are admitting it. Powerful stuff. My life's purpose is to make a positive difference in the lives of others through education. That's what I try to do in my workshops, what I try to do in my writing, I try to do in my research. That's what I'm here for, I believe. It helps keep me focused. And anyone can do it. Here's an interesting study. I mentioned that there's not an awful lot that applies, but this is a, a very powerful study conducted by the Harvard Business School over, are you ready for this? Over 20 years. Longitudinal study, 20 years. 15,000 participants. 15,000 participants. A total, of course, hundreds of pages long. Harvard Business School, it has to be. But for our purposes, it said the unhappiest retirees had not gone on to do anything productive beyond pleasing themselves. Astounding. Multi-millionaires. Laborers. Wide range. That is what they discovered about the unhappiest retirees who were all in phase one. It's all about me. I know two people who are in phase one, who admit to being in phase one. One says he's happy, he's delusional. The other one says she's happy and she's maybe closer to telling the truth. But very few people very few people stay in phase one. The unhappiest of retirees in all the other phases are ones who are doing nothing beyond pleasing themselves. I think you'll agree, most of us need to find activities that we find meaningful, that give us a sense of purpose. And whatever that means, it will be different for, of course, so many different people. Creative expression, painting, whatever it might be doesn't matter, but something that gives us meaning and purpose is required for us to be productive members and to be successful phase four people. I believe it's true. Any, anytime you use your God-given abilities, your unique ability to help others, you're in fact doing what you were put on earth to do. So remember, you're not alone in this transition, folks. There are 10,000 people retiring every day. We have more options to consider than ever before, more time likely to do it than ever before in recorded human history, and a great opportunity to combine the things that we love to do and the things that we're good at to make the world a better place. Which leads me to my final little story about my friend Bill. Bill spent 40 years as a dentist inflicting pain. <laughs> Bill is one of the most successful phase four retirees I have ever met, and I'm proud to call him a friend. He lives in our Gulf community in Southwest Florida. And Bill had this idea, in our community there are 947 doors, units of various types. Bill had this idea that despite the fact that we are built as a, as a golf community, he believed that there's more to retirement than golf, and that, given a chance, people would love to do things other than play golf. He also believed that there was a tremendous, that there is a tremendous pool of ability in our community, and that if you ask people to contribute, they would almost always do so. So, four or five years ago, uh, I helped him a little bit, but it was, it was Bill's thing. He approached people and said, um, you're really good at painting. 
would you be kind enough to meet with a group of people who are interested in learning how to paint? There, there's no, we can't pay you. It, it's got to be a volunteer. Of course. Mejong. So ladies are great at Mejong. Would you teach some others who want? Of course. Bridge. You name it. A wide variety. Bill in particular is really good at, at I, I stuff, at Apple, uh, Macintosh stuff, iPhones, iPads, all that stuff. And he knows, because lots of people have told him, you know, lots of people in our community were given these things by their children for Christmas, but didn't know how to turn the damn things on. <laughs> right? So Bill set up these things. We couldn't, we couldn't accommodate the number of people who wanted to come and learn how to use their iPads that they had been given for Christmas. We had to do it over and over and over again. So that's how it started. So let me just share with you some of the details. In 2011, which was the first year that we did this, there were nine people who were pigeon who were who were asked and, and agreed to to do these volunteer presentations. Nine offerings. There were 210 uh, registrations. Two years later, there were not nine new offerings, but there were 72 offerings. The number of participants had risen from 210 to 694. Two years later, uh, there were not 72 offerings, but 115 offerings. Registration had risen from 694 to 1,940. What started as little, you know, black and white, eight by ten stuff saying here, you know, bridge, mahjong, how to fix your bicycle, iPad, all that kind of stuff. It's grown into a 64-page glossy brochure that represents the current offerings in our community in Southwest Florida. Unbelievable what one person could do. Just an example of what anybody who really decides they want to make a difference can do. And here's the beauty of it. This is the secret sauce that just I love. Because, you know, we talked about the five losses, the five inevitable losses in phase two. Well, what Bill has discovered is that he's got a new structure for his life. No longer inflicting pain, inflicting joy. He's got a new identity. He's no longer, you know, the he's the guy that makes things happen. You want you want a program, talk to Bill. New relationships. When you go around trying to convince 24, 30, 40, 50, 60 people to make a contribution, you get to meet people, you get to know people, you create some new relationships, a renewed sense of purpose, and a sense of enhanced power, not that Bill could care less about enhanced sense of power at all. But it's interesting, the things that are so much a part of the losses in phase two are so much a part of the, the beauty and the things that come back in phase four. That's what phase four can be. So, to wrap it up. There are four identifiable phases. You know what they are now. It's virtually impossible to avoid any of them, though the time we spend in each can vary significantly and level of intensity. Phase two, I'm sure you would agree, is the most dangerous. It's not where we want to spend a further of our lives. But despite several phase three experiments, I've seen people unable to break through the phase four. I believe only 50 to 60% of people actually ever get there. And some slide back into phase two, which is the saddest thing to see. But we've seen that as well. Clearly phase four is the most gratifying, real sense of purpose, mission, contribution. So it's okay to tire, but never to retire in the usual sense. It's okay to wear out, but don't you dare rust out. It's only when you're through learning and changing and reinventing ourselves and working to stay involved, only then are we through, are we done. Don't let that happen. So, 10,000 people are gonna to retire today, tomorrow, the next day. Most of them are gonna march into retirement without a clue about any of these challenges that they're going to face. My hope is that through our time together here and through the book that you'll be receiving imminently, that you will be forewarned and that forewarned is forearmed. I hope that you'll be able to deal with it better than you might have otherwise. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today.
Thank you so much. For that. Thank you, Dr. Moynes. Um, appreciate your presentation. Uh, Dr. Moynes will be around all evening. He's going to stay with us tonight, uh, have dinner with us. So if you have questions or you'd like to talk to him about, uh, about his presentation, he'll be available.